this lesson, we will begin our discussion on the Anglo-Saxon legal system. Now, by and large, we see even to this very day remnants of the Anglo-Saxon legal system as part of the United Kingdom, as well as in some instances, outreached into Commonwealth countries, as well as across the pond into the United States. Um, for instance, on the one hand, you have what is known as a writ instrument, um, which is seen even to this day, and most notably, if Hollywood movies are anything to go by, jury trials have now encapsulated most of what we equate with trial law, with court procedure. Evidently, the democratic process of being tried by a group or a jury of one's peers. So a writ and a jury are both remnants of um, the Anglo-Saxon legal system. These we will go through somewhat later on in this particular course. But to begin with, one of the most notable features of the Anglo-Saxon legal system, particularly prior to the Norman conquest of 1066, is that the system at large was actually based on legislation which was derived through a form of law codes. These law codes were developed by the seminal Ethelbert, or the King of Kent, way back in 600 AD. Another notable feature of the Anglo-Saxon legal system was how decentralized it really was. Basically, the legal system took on the form of what is known as shires as well as hundreds. So when the king himself extended um, his authority over the entirety, holistically, of the country, or in this case England, they left the shire courts, which is considering it in the context of a municipality, for instance. The shire courts were left with the basic administrative uh, authority or the rights therein. Now, mind you, before we proceed, one of the fundamental things that you need to understand is that although Ethelbert, um, the King of Kent, developed these law codes, um, so to speak, they weren't necessarily akin to what we understand today as modern legislation. Um, on the contrary, unlike legislation today, which is by and large something that applies to the whole country and is based on policy derived from a multitude of different stakeholders in a government, these law codes uh, were much more political in nature. And this was a given somewhat because the legal system of the UK was still in its infancy and because of that, the law codes were just there as a placeholder for kings to utilize as well as proliferate their power. Now, the king himself was somewhat in uninvolved. He was largely uninvolved in whatever proceedings, except, for instance, um, the occasional grants or charters. You can equate this to the modern realm of an executive order, for instance. Um, he had several representatives in those smaller administrative districts, um, such as the shires and the hundreds. Um, quite notably, and this is a fun fact in itself, um, the person who was in charge or the representative of the king that was in charge of the shire was known as a shire reeve. Now, a shire reeve became known as a sheriff, and today we still have this role, uh, perhaps not in the same capacity. Um, in essence, the hierarchy then was that the shire was above that of a hundred. So a hundred was even a smaller uh, municipality or a smaller authoritative district. And the sheriff or the shire reeve is the person that appointed uh, the bailiff who is in charge of a hundred. This is one of the best examples of what we touched on earlier uh, of the decentralized nature of the Anglo-Saxon legal system. Now, there have been much debate as to whether this worked. Obviously, there has been evolution since then. But considering the fact that we are talking about a period of not necessarily unrest, but confusion for the most part, uh, specifically just before the 1066 Norman Conquest, this seems to be one of the primary ways in which uh, control uh, was proliferated by the king himself. Now, if we take... Um, the legal system and justice as a whole, uh, you would notice that when you consider the Shire and the Hundred, the vastness of both different 
authoritative units or the districts mean that the powers vested in them also change quite a bit. Uh, so, for instance, in the case of a shire, which was presided over by the sheriff or the shire reef, was not necessarily a judge. He was more like a president as such of that smaller unit. These people were called suitors as such, and um, they made um, they were made up rather of men who who attended the shire court as such. Now, the main powers of the shires or this particular district were basically for charters and writs to be read out. What's most important to understand then is that the sheriff is in turn a representative of the king, so he is the king's voice. On the other hand, when you consider the hundreds, for instance, they were made up of much smaller units than um, shires. So because of that, an entirety or a bunch of hundreds would then make up one shire. And as I noted earlier, it's the bailiff that presided over um, a hundred, whereas a shire was resided over by the shire reeve. Um, when it came to the Norman Conquest, or the period soon after the Norman Conquest, it was very notable that all of the local disputes um, were still handled in the same manner, even though there was much usurpation throughout the country uh, with the Norman Conquest. So the hundreds remained as it, um, as it then was. There are several notable academics that have spoken uh, quite eloquently about uh, the history of the English law, two of which being Baker as well as Maitland, and you will see references to them quite significantly in this course. So I urge you to have a look at both Baker and Maitland in terms of your reading material outside of this course as well, because they are the foremost authorities in relation to the Anglo-Saxon legal system and so on. Now, what Baker has quite eloquently outlined uh, is that there was no uniformity, and we have discussed this in relation to the decentralization uh, of the Anglo-Saxon legal system. But custom in itself changed from people to people and area to area. So this non-uniformity is the real reason why even today um, we see an evolution of the United Kingdom in terms of its justice, in terms of its legal systems, as well as governance, as opposed to many other countries that have had many breaks in their history and have had to pretty much rewrite their constitutions, the way they govern themselves. Um, as a byproduct of how the UK has been uh, from the time of the Norman Conquest, you see that this has led to, for instance, if you're doing constitutional law, your understanding of the fact that um, the UK has an unwritten constitution, um, whereas many other countries have written constitutions. The UK, by and large, does not have one solid document. It's basically made up of several different sources. Um, this could be seen as one of the first indicators of why the UK is the UK today. Now, um, we'll go on to detailing, for example, procedure, which we're going to touch on now, later on in this course, but basically one of the first things that you need to understand is in relation to the legal system or the purpose of justice being proliferated, the fundamental aspect of it that defines the Anglo-Saxon system based on what we see today is how harsh, how brutal, how barbaric uh, the means of not just punishment, but also of determining whether someone should be punished was seen back in the day. Um, so, for instance, you have the concepts of ordeal. Um, the ordeal is basically a mechanism by which proof is derived from a perpetrator or purported perpetrator, someone who's accused, either by way of fire or by water. So, just a quick example, uh, in terms of a particular person who's accused, a judge would order that the person be burnt uh, with hot iron and then immediately wrapped with silk. And a few days later, once the silk is opened, uh, if the wound has festered, he or she would be pronounced guilty. And this is one of the most haphazard ways of um, finding out whether a person is guilty or innocent. But you need to understand the period in which this was done was quite religious in nature, 
Um, there was not much way of evidence, for example. And we see even today that when you research the period of the Anglo-Saxon rule, that many of these barbaric procedures were somewhat fettered by individuals, such as the person who was supposed to wrap the, the particular wound with silk, he or she would actually put ointment or put medication on it, unbeknownst to the judge as well as the participants of this horrendous act, so that when it is removed, um, it would not have festered. And we see these individuals taking justice into their own hands, so to speak. Um, Baker has quite eloquently outlined this as how human intervention has prevented uh, injustices from occurring back in the day. Uh, but we'll touch on this when we get into procedure later on in this course. In the next lesson, we will begin our discussion on the courts of the common law, which is broken up into several different segments, considering the vastness of the lesson itself. Thanks a lot for watching this video. Make sure you check out some of my other courses available online and reach out for the tutoring masterclasses through the links below. Have fun, stay safe, and as always, obey the law.